By mid-morning, it was all over. Some officers said the last attack had come at 0920. Some believed it arrived 20 minutes later. The ships were still firing at 1100, but by noon the shock was wearing off, and Admiral Husband E. Kimmel's staff was beginning to pull itself together for retaliatory action against an enemy that had suddenly disappeared. Smoke rose above Ford Island and the surrounding installations at Pearl Harbor. The battleship Arizona at Mooring F-7 had been struck repeatedly and had settled atop the 12-inch main that provided fresh water for Ford Island, crushing the pipe. A six-inch temporary line running to the south end of the island had been broken on the Navy Yard side by Japanese bombs. But already the 14th Naval District's public works officers and men were repairing the lines, placing a new 16-inch main from Hospital Point to the island. This rebound symbolised the spirit at Pearl Harbour on that frightful December 7, 1941, as Captain H.F. Bruns symbolised the Navy. Well before noon, the captain had organised the workers in the yard to get the gantry crane clear of the fire that burned between dry docks, and the new dry dock was put in shape for service. As anyone could see by casting an eye about the wreckage of the battleships in the harbour, dry docks aplenty would be needed. Captain Bruns and his men symbolised the Navy spirit, but they did not symbolise American naval policy of that moment, for if one flat statement about Pearl Harbour could be made, it must be that America's naval leaders, from the President Commander-in-Chief down to the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, were surprised. The extent of the surprise, the reasons for it, are matters for limitless debate among naval historians. But there is no question about the surprise. It was an old Japanese technique, one that had worked very well at Port Arthur nearly half a century earlier. At that time, the Japanese had been talking with the Russian Tsar's government in St. Petersburg, while the Japanese fleet went to war. Now it was happening again. One problem was that this time the techniques of naval warfare had so changed that the victims of the surprise attack were allowed no leeway at all. Even if the United States Army Air Corps, charged with the defence of Hawaiian Air, had been thoroughly alert, some of the damage would still have been done. The battleships were caught in harbour that day, but not because the Pacific fleet was totally napping. The big ships were moored because they were too slow to keep up with the carrier task forces that were on almost constant patrol in the Pacific. Vice Admiral Wilson Brown, then commanding the scouting force, had worked out a programme with Admiral Kimmel, which called for one task force to be in Pearl Harbour on the weekend, while two were at work guarding. The state of mind of the officers of the fleet could only be regarded as negative. For four long years, the fleet had been on the alert. The war scares had begun in 1937 and 1938. The newspapers would run scare headlines, the rumours would spread across the country, and soon there would be an official report of a threat. Three such frights, beginning early in 1938, put the wind up in the whole fleet. Typical was one report of an impending Japanese attack on the battleships lying in San Pedro Harbour. The battle force came to general quarters on this occasion. All liberty was cancelled. Officers were called back to their ships. The whaleboats of the battleships were run over the side, and they circled their ships all night long to keep invaders away. A division of destroyers was called up from San Diego to patrol, and the planes of the battle force, the carriers and the patrol force flew missions all over that area of the Pacific. On such occasions the tension was replaced by a flood of relief. But the relief-tension relief pattern brought with it a certain anaesthetic reaction among the officers of the fleet, like the reaction of the townspeople in the fable of the little boy who cried wolf. As an officer of the Pacific fleet in those days said, all those scares got to be ridiculous and people thought, oh thunder, here's another one of these, we won't pay any attention. By 1940, there was also a good deal of defeatism in high places. One day that year, Captain Harry W. Hill of the War Plans Division in Washington was called upon to make a presentation of the Orange Plan, the War Plan against Japan, before a number of the senior officers of the Navy. His latest assignment had been as Fleet War Plans Officer to Admiral Block and Admiral Richardson. Hill made a vigorous presentation, and was dismayed to discover that the admirals looked upon the plan as totally impractical. 
Hill argued that the plan had to be made with the assumption that in time of war the material would be made available to the Navy, but the admirals, having seen Congress cut down their budget year after year, were uniformly gloomy, including Admiral Harold R. Stark, the Chief of Naval Operations. The single exception was Admiral Ernest J. King, Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet. King, furious with his brother admirals, berated them that day for their lack of aggressive spirit. Right there, he made a follower of Harry Hill. Not all the admirals were convinced, and the fleet continued to be divided between incautious optimism on the one hand and overcautious pessimism on the other. And yet, that is an oversimplification. The fact that the carriers were not caught at Pearl Harbor in the Japanese attack was not simply a matter of luck. It was part of a careful plan. For two years, the fleet had been based at Pearl Harbor, for many more years than that the fleet had practiced carrier task force attacks on the big base, attacks that in reality could only come from one source, Japan. On Pearl Harbor Day, Vice Admiral William F. Halsey was on his way to port with Task Force 8 and the carrier Enterprise. His guns were armed and his torpedoes carried warheads. Rear Admiral Milo Dremel, his second in command, had taken off on orders to form Task Force 2 while at sea and had come back to port. Dremel's principal assignment was as commander of destroyers, Pacific, and his destroyers had live ammunition in the ready boxes, depth charges in the racks, and warheads on torpedoes. Dremel gives an indication of the quality of surprise in his story of those days. He had brought his destroyers, the cruisers, and the three battleships of Halsey's force back to Pearl Harbor on Friday, nursing the 17 knot battleships into port with the faster ships. The smell of war was in the air. On that Friday, Admiral Dremel had gone to fleet headquarters for a talk with Captain W. W. Smith, Admiral Kimmel's chief of staff. Smith had informed him that in Washington the Japanese had burned their diplomatic code books. That word meant war to Dremel, and he said as much. Then he went back to his flagship, the cruiser Detroit, to await developments. Rear Admiral Dremel was hesitant to give shore leave to his destroyer men, for in his opinion the world situation was critical. That day, however, the cruiser sailors and the men of the battleships had shore leave, so he granted leave. Admiral Kimmel, he said to himself, must have information that a destroyer commander would not have. Dremel was aboard the Detroit when the Japanese attacked. Before 10.30 his little ships had steam and he was ready to go to sea. He was designated as Commander Special Task Force 1 and directed to reinforce Admiral Halsey's force returning from landing planes on Wake Island. The order was revoked and about one half hour later it was directed to proceed, which indicates a measure of the confusion that existed at Pearl Harbor that morning. In Washington, the confusion was as it was at Pearl Harbor. War was expected, or half expected, but the coming of it had caught all America unawares. Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox was relaxing that day, quite a usual thing to do on a Sunday. Under Secretary James Forrestal was off in Long Island for the weekend. Assistant Secretary for Air Artemis Gates had flown down to Pensacola and was playing golf there with Captain A.C. Reed commander of the Naval Air Station. Gates Reed, a young commander named Arthur Radford, and several other officers were teeing off when the word of attack came. Gates did not believe it, and it was only when messages were brought to the course that the game was cancelled and the officers went to Reed's headquarters. One message had ordered Captain Reed to execute the current war plan, Rainbow, against Orange, which meant the Japanese. Gates was extremely interested in seeing that plan then and there. They went to the safe and discovered that it was closed by a time lock and could not be opened until Monday morning. There was an indication of the readiness of all America on that December 7th. Once the attack came, those charged with the defence of the United States moved. Artemis Gates flew back to Washington. Forrestal came back from Long Island. Before they got there, the admirals on duty in the Navy Department had begun filing into the office of Admiral Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, to wait for word of the damage and the situation. The messages were coming, one after another, and each was more portentous of loss than the one before it. The very existence of the job that Artemis Gates held 
indicated part of the change that had begun in naval thinking in the very recent past. Gates had been appointed Assistant Secretary for Air in the summer of 1941, and when he came to Washington, Secretary Knox had explained that he was giving Gates all his authority in the field of naval air, because he recognised the need for air power, but was not himself air-oriented. Gates was a Forrestal protégé, both were old-time naval aviators, and their presence together showed the change. The meetings began, then, as the officers filed into Main Navy, the old building of the fleet forces. Rear Admiral Chester W. Nimitz was one of the early arrivals that day. He was chief of the Bureau of Navigation, the Navy's personnel department, and was regarded as one of the rising young stars of the fleet. A few months earlier, at Bremerton on the west coast, Rear Admiral E. B. Fenner, one of the old admirals, had asked Nimitz if he was ready to take command when the war began. Nimitz, who was then commander of a cruiser division, had stopped off on his way to California from Alaska. In his shy, controlled way, Nimitz had smiled and said nothing, passed it off. But for the past five years, the seniors of the Navy had been keeping their eyes on Nimitz, along with Kimmel and Gormley. In his important post, the white-haired, smiling Nimitz had maintained an almost unbelievable gentleness and equilibrium. Whatever the request from his seniors, the commanders of the fleets, and the administrators above him. He had been chief of the Bureau of Navigation since 1939. It was not a job to make an admiral popular, but Nimitz had become extremely popular. As always in his career, men above and below him had been impressed by him, those above with his dedication and quiet competence, those below with his sense of compassion, his feeling for justice and a humility that was not too usual among those who achieved flag rank. Another admiral who filed into Stark's office that morning was Rear Admiral John H. Towers, chief of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics. He and Nimitz were old acquaintances. Most recently, they had been fighting a battle for control of the Naval Air Forces, with Towers pushing to secure air training for the Bureau of Aeronautics, and Nimitz standing steadfast for the traditional Navy way, whereby air training fell under the Bureau of Navigation. Towers was a brilliant aviator, naval aviator number two as a matter of record, who had come up to achieve flag rank in an arm of the naval service that the aviators felt had first been viewed with deep suspicion, and then with cordial dislike by the old-fashioned admirals of the past, despite the successes of admirals Moffat, Yarnell and Reeves. To Towers, Nimitz represented the past, the best of it perhaps, because Towers respected Nimitz for his abilities. But to Towers, Nimitz was a battleship admiral, while he, Towers, had the airman's independence and contempt for the old way of thinking. The admirals and the civilian chieftains met in Washington on December 8th, and that same day the Joint Board of the Army and Navy convened to talk of the war. The only senior officer absent was General Arnold, the Army Air Corps commander. He had gone fishing in those happy days just before December 7th and had not yet returned. The admirals and generals met again on December 9th for two hours, and by that time the picture was becoming clear. After the Pearl Harbour attack, off in London, Captain Charles A. Lockwood, the US naval attaché to the embassy, had cursed and scribbled furiously in his diary on learning of the destruction dealt among the battleships. Who is responsible? he had asked angrily, if rhetorically. It seemed all the more insane and infuriating to Lockwood, because on the night of December 6th, the British Admiralty had notified him of the movement of a large part of the Japanese fleet. But the British were watching the movement in terms of their own territories, and when nothing appeared to menace them, the alert had been cancelled, and Britain had relaxed as much as a nation at war might. But if Captain Lockwood's question was rhetorical, Secretary Knox was in anything but a rhetorical state of mind as he pondered the same question. On December 9th, the Secretary set out for Pearl Harbour to discover precisely what had gone wrong and who was responsible. At Pearl Harbour, the activity was intense and had been since midday on December 7th. If there was momentary confusion in the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet, it was no more than that. When the attack began that morning, the staff duty officers and his assistants scurried about the officers' quarters above the base and much further afield. 
Admiral Kimmel lived in a big house on Makalapa Drive, and he was one of the first to be notified. But his flag secretary, for example, lived beyond Diamond Head, and so did many officers. The fleet was not on a real war status, it was as simple as that. There was part of the confusion, for many of the attributes of war status were apparent. For example, Admiral Kimmel had ordered the ships to have ammunition at the guns, and thus they were able to get away from anti-aircraft fire in a minute or so after the bombs and torpedoes began falling. The activity had intensified all morning and all afternoon. By 1445, the Lexington's task force was proceeding at 27 knots to intercept the enemy carrier. Someone thought there was only one. On the assumption that the Japanese had sent their planes from a point 200 miles south of Pearl Harbor and had then departed back southward toward Jalui. In fact, the Japanese had come in from the north and had retired to the north. Yet if the assumption was wrong, the effort was not lacking. The Enterprise Task Force was out searching too, as far as 700 miles out of Pearl Harbor. PBYs, patrol bombers, were spaced 50 miles apart and were searching. Army aircraft were alerted for search, and the available ships were out on patrol. The Saratoga, which arrived at San Diego just as the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor, loaded munitions, stores and planes all night, and sailed for Oahu Monday morning. Army and Navy were now fully alert, so alert that in mid-afternoon the Army warned the Navy to look out for parachute troops when five unidentified planes were reported over Honolulu. That afternoon the fleet prepared for an air raid at dawn, and all heavy ships were warned to stay away from Pearl Harbor after dark. On December 8th the confusion seemed to be lessening. There were reports of attacks, Enemy planes were sighted over Oahu early in the afternoon. An unidentified submarine was spotted off Diamond Head, and two more were seen south of Hickam Towers. But to match these fears came the reassuring word from the Army Information Centre that the Army was reasonably sure there were no enemy planes within 200 miles. By the next morning, calm was restored, so that all concerned were reminded that the Pan American Clipper would fly over Oahu shortly after 1100 on its way from Midway to Hilo and should not be shot down. Admiral Halsey's Task Force 8 was told to return to Pearl at moderate speed with one destroyer squadron. When the Enterprise entered the harbour, the squadron was to report to the Commandant of the 14th Naval District for anti submarine warfare. As for the rest of the task force, it was to operate 50 miles north of the Kauai Oahu line until relieved. Kimmel was ordering ship's plates and parts. The liner Lurline was chartered to bring repair and salvage experts from the mainland, and all efforts were being made at Pearl Harbor to do what could be done with the materials at hand. Hawaii and its bases were on real war status now. The base went to general quarters a half hour before sunrise from total blackout, remained alert all day, and went back to general quarters. The Pacific Fleet and its commanders were ready. Ships moved in and out of the harbour, but most of those available for patrol were out constantly, searching for the Japanese, their crews angry and looking for a fight. The confusion of these first days was not confined to Pearl Harbour. On December 9th, San Francisco radio station KNX broadcast a report that 60 Japanese planes had flown to within a few miles of the Golden Gate before being driven off by Army and Navy fighters. There had, of course, been no such attack. The schizophrenia that had marked the past was still present too. From Washington came this disheartening advice, originated in the office of the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stark. Because of the great success of the Japanese raid on the 7th, it is expected to be promptly followed up by additional attacks in order to render Hawaii untenable as a naval and air base, in which eventuality it is believed the Japanese have suitable forces for the initial occupation of the islands other than Oahu, including Midway, Maui and Hawaii. Under present circumstances, it seems questionable that Midway can be retained, but it is hoped that Johnson, Palmyra and Samoa may be. In expectation of further air raids and the inadequacy of defences of Oahu, 
the Chief of Naval Operations considers it essential that wounded vessels able to proceed under their own power should be sent to the west coast as soon as possible with due regard to safety from current raiding forces, and very great importance of effective counter-attacks on these raiders by you. Until defences are increased, it is doubtful if Pearl should be used as a base, except for patrol craft, naval aircraft and submarines, or for short periods when it is reasonably certain Japanese attacks will not be made. Consider it especially important that submarines and tenders not suffer losses. Admiral Kimmel was dismayed to receive this message. To be sure, the Japanese were on the move. He had received messages telling of attacks on Midway and Wake Island on December 8th. The next day, Guam was attacked and Wake was struck again. He had been out of contact with Guam and Wake part of the time, and when the news came, it was not encouraging. Still, Kimmel had no intention of giving up. The Navy Yard was asking Washington for 500 cots, 10,000 blankets, 2,000 scoop shovels, for wrenches, automatic pistols, belts and holsters, for 10,000 steel helmets and 2,000 more Springfield rifles. Kimmel and his men wanted to fight, not talk about retreat. On December 11th, Kimmel replied to Stark. Since the appearance of the enemy in this area, all tactical efforts with all available forces have been vigorously prosecuted toward locating and destroying the enemy forces, primarily carriers. Our heavy losses have not seriously depleted our fast striking forces, nor reduced morale and determination. Pearl must be used for essential supply and overhaul facilities, and must be provided with additional aircraft, both Army and Navy, also relief pilots and maintenance personnel. Pearl channels are clear, the industrial establishment is intact and doing excellent work. Otherwise, your suggestions are carried out. This forthright attitude, even if particularly unresponsive to the Chief of Naval Operations, quite fitted a young admiral who had been regarded as one of the Navy's comers in recent years. Kimmel was a Kentucky boy who had entered the Naval Academy in 1900 and graduated in 1904. He had served in destroyers, battleships and cruisers, and was Franklin D. Roosevelt's naval aide when Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy in World War I. He had seen action in the pacification of Cuba and at Vera Cruz, then was executive officer of the USS Arkansas at the time of the German surrender. He was noted for his gunnery and his innovations in the field. He had served with distinction ashore at the US Naval Gun Factory in Washington and as captain of the Naval Yard at Cavite in the Philippines. He had commanded a division of destroyers in the Asiatic fleet during the Chinese Revolution. He had been a battleship commander a cruiser divisional commander and chief of staff to the commander of the battle force in the Pacific. Kimmel had gone to the Naval War College. He had served a hitch as assistant director of fleet training and another in the office of the chief of naval operations. He had been a naval budget officer for a time and had gone on a goodwill mission as a sort of ambassador. Early in 1941, he was commander of cruisers in the Pacific Fleet Battle Force, a very responsible position, when suddenly President Roosevelt decided to remove Admiral James O. Richardson as commander of the fleet. Although Kimmel was very distinctly a junior admiral at the time, he was advanced past many others, Wilson Brown included, and jumped into the job of Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. He had been advanced thus because in the eyes of the senior naval officers and the civilians who ultimately controlled selection, he was an outstanding officer. His predecessor, Admiral Richardson, had once spoken out about the Navy way in promotions, giving an idea of what it took to make Admiral. Only the officer who is intelligent, thoroughly capable and energetic will reach the commander's grade, and only the officer who is brilliant, resourceful, thoroughly capable and energetic and has good health will reach the captain's grade, and the rank of flag officer is reserved for those few officers who combine outstanding personality and good fortune with the other characteristics listed. Kimmel had been bright, diligent, healthy and lucky until December 7, 1941. On that day he was still bright, diligent and healthy. On December 11, Kimmel was trying to fight a war with very little help. The day before, he and his staff had prepared an estimate of the military situation. Because of the loss of the battleship force to the fleet, 
the United States in the Pacific was committed to the strategic defensive for the time being. However, said the report, a very powerful striking force of carriers, cruisers and destroyers survive. These forces must be operated boldly and vigorously on the tactical offensive in order to retrieve our initial disaster. The task of the fleet, for the moment, was to protect sea communications of the United States and her allies, to support the army in defence of Hawaii, Samoa, Midway, Johnson and Palmyra, to raid the enemy at sea and to defend Wake Island. The fleet was also to protect the area east of 180 degrees longitude and prevent extension of the Japanese into the Western Hemisphere. Considering the enemy courses of action, Kimmel and his staff concluded that the Japanese would make more raids on Hawaii, Midway and perhaps the Aleutian Islands. Kimmel expected more raids on Wake and perhaps a landing attempt. He foresaw the concentration of Japanese submarines between Oahu and the mainland and submarine and surface raids on communications between the islands and the west coast. The American course of action would be to keep the naval forces at sea, anticipating these raids, to fight off the raids and keep the fleet forces north and west of Oahu to intercept any force moving toward or away from the west coast. The bases, such as Wake and Samoa, must be protected. He proposed to send the battleships back to the Pacific coast and use searching and striking groups of carriers, cruisers and destroyers, supplied largely at sea, to support bases and intercept the Japanese. Kimmel would have three task forces, each consisting of one fleet carrier, two or three cruisers and six to nine destroyers. One task force would operate near Midway, one would operate north of Oahu, and the third would be en route or being supplied at Pearl Harbor. On arrival of a fourth carrier, an additional force would be organised. Besides this, battleships and destroyers would convoy ships between the west coast and Hawaii. Shipping would be kept to a minimum as far as Australia and New Zealand were concerned. Submarines would patrol Japanese waters and protect Midway and Wake Islands. On December 11th, Admiral Kimmel was trying to follow this plan. Task Force 12, commanded by Admiral Wilson Brown, was 230 miles west of Oahu and having trouble fueling. Early in the morning, the tanker Neosho had come alongside the Lexington. The wind was blowing about 30 knots and the seas were rough. Four times the tow lines were passed and four times they dropped away. Three times the messenger line parted and on the fourth throw, the towing block tumbled and could not be righted. By 11.40, everyone, including Admiral Brown, was disgusted and discouraged. He gave orders to postpone the attempt to fuel. The ships moved apart and took course toward Midway. Admiral Halsey in Task Force 8 was patrolling to the north, and Admiral Fitch in the Saratoga was coming out from San Diego. In the headquarters at Pearl Harbor, Admiral Kimmel and his staff were making plans for the relief of Wake Island, which was under attack. There were a number of civilians on Wake, construction workers, and they should be retrieved and sent home. The island needed more air support and could receive it from a squadron that was coming in aboard the Saratoga. So far, so good. But December 11th was also the day on which Secretary Knox arrived at Pearl Harbour. The Secretary's first question was typical and brusque. Did you receive my message on Saturday night? The message had been a warning against a surprise Japanese attack, but searches of the fleet files failed to disclose that it had ever arrived. The Secretary wanted to know what had happened, why, and what Kimmel proposed to do. While they were talking, Kimmel's operations officer, Captain C. A. McMorris, came into the room to present a proposal that Kimmel dispatch forces to relieve Wake Island. Knox liked the cut of this officer's jib, and what he had to say pleased the Secretary more. He proposed to defend the island. In these hours, Kimmel was listening to many proposals from members of his staff. McMorris spoke strongly against the evacuation of the island, and Secretary Knox, misreading Kimmel's quiet reaction as negative, was further convinced that Kimmel was not a fighting man. By day's end, Admiral Kimmel had definitely decided on the reinforcement of Wake Island, but Knox was not aware of this decision. The Secretary was busy taking in the extent of the disaster around Ford Island, and was so horrified to see the wreckage of the great battleship fleet that he was not really listening to his admiral. 
he left the very next day for the west coast. Kimmel knew that the secretary had not been pleased with what he saw, but Kimmel also knew that he had a war to fight, and after seeing Knox off, he began laying his plans. Wilson Brown's Task Force 12 was still struggling with the fuel problem. At 0930 on December 12th, the cruiser Portland was refueling from the Neosho, moving on a northerly course. At 12.10, the Chicago was fueling when Portland reported a submarine bearing 200 degrees just off the Lexington side. The men of the Chicago cast off, but in such a hurry that they pulled the fueling nipples right out of the Neosho and made it impossible for the tanker to fuel another ship without repairs. So it was back to Pearl, with a distinct flaw showing up in Admiral Kimmel's plan to keep the carrier task forces at sea. Lexington was still not fuelled when Kimmel ordered the force back to Pearl to do the job. On December 13th, Task Force 12 entered Pearl Harbour to receive Kimmel's orders changing the name of the force to Task Force 11 and sending it to raid Jaluit Atoll as part of the Kimmel plan to relieve Wake, for that island atoll was under almost daily bombardment by the Japanese. McMorris had suggested that the seaplane tender Tangier be taken to Wake to evacuate the civilians, and that she carry ammunition, supplies and radar sets for the defence of the island. This plan was now approved, and orders were prepared to dispatch the Saratoga. She arrived on December 13th and became the nucleus of Task Force 14. Rear Admiral Aubrey W. Fitch was in command when the Saratoga came in, but Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher was selected to lead the task force. Fletcher and Fitch had been classmates at the Academy, 1906, but Fletcher was senior in terms of the date of his Admiral's commission. On December 15th, the Tangier and the tanker assigned to the task force, 14, sailed from Pearl Harbour. Saratoga and the rest of the force were held up, for the carrier had to fuel. Wake was being bombed almost daily by two- and four-engine bombers, and when Admiral Kimmel reported his plans for relief, Admiral Stark radioed his concurrence. The next day, the rest of Task Force 14 set out for Wake, and it was decided that when Halsey arrived with Task Force 8, he would receive the word that as soon as possible he would go out to join the others in this vigorous, if risky, operation. Admiral Kimmel's plans were thorough. Halsey and Brown were to seek out the enemy and divert or destroy them if possible, while Fletcher moved in to relieve Wake. All the way home, however, Secretary Knox had fumed over what he had seen at Pearl Harbour, and by the time he reached Washington on December 14th, he was prepared to report to President Roosevelt that the fleet needed a complete changeover at the top. Halsey's task force was still in harbour as the machine began to grind back in the main navy. Kimmel was informed that he would be relieved. Admiral Dremel, who had been out with his destroyers, came into port on December 17th and made his way quickly to the office of the Commander-in-Chief. He had a bone to pick. Sometime earlier, Kimmel had planned the relief of destroyer captains over the age of 45. President Roosevelt had the same idea. Dremel did not like the idea, particularly in wartime, because it meant he would have to relieve the captains of nearly all his force. He came to argue on this afternoon of December 17th, Dremel found Kimmel sitting quietly at his desk, and they talked. The destroyer commander suggested in some heat that Kimmel had no business concerning himself with such details, and that if he did not approve of Dremel's conduct of his command, he should relieve him. Kimmel agreed in a very mild tone that he had overstepped, and then looked at the clock. It was a few moments before three in the afternoon. "'I am relieved at three, he said. Dremel was taken aback. He offered to leave the room, but Kimmel told him to stay. Then, at 1500, Vice Admiral W.S. Pye came into the room. Pye was commander of the battle force, one of those admirals who had been passed over when Kimmel was promoted to head the fleet. The two senior admirals read their orders, while Dremel looked on. Then Kimmel left the building and his command. Dremel went back to his ship, conscious of having seen the destruction of a fine career. He had scarcely regained his cabin on the Detroit when word came that the commander-in-chief wished to see him. Back at headquarters, he learned that he was to become the new operational chief of staff of Pi, thus stepping in front of Captain Smith. Orders were orders. 
Dremel went to his desk, and his flag lieutenant went to the Detroit and packed the Admiral's gear. Admiral Pye was simply the interim commander of the Pacific Fleet. President Roosevelt and Secretary Knox had decided for reasons of high policy that Kimmel must immediately be relieved. It was perhaps not totally coincidental that on December 15th, Knox had announced some of the losses in the Japanese attack, the sinking of the Arizona, the capsizing of the Oklahoma, the damage to the Utah, the Oglala, and three destroyers. In any event, the political leaders took an action that seemed necessary to them and appointed Pai, although the real commander of the Pacific was to be Chester W. Nimitz. The younger admiral could not reach Pearl Harbor for several days, so Pai was put in to hold the line. Younger is a relative term. Nimitz was born in 1885, Pi in 1880, and by the time a man reaches middle age, a five-year difference seldom amounts to much. And perhaps age was not the difference in this case either, so much as a manner of thinking. Admiral Richardson's prescription for the achievement of flag rank in the Navy went just so far. It did not consider how the Admiral would comport himself once he achieved those two stars. Particularly, the Richardson formula did not delve into the most important of all conditions, what was required of a naval leader in that period of which all of them trained all their lives, the time of war. Seemingly, Pai was admirably suited for command of the Pacific Fleet. He had completed the four-year course at the Naval Academy in 1901, spent two years at sea as a past midshipman, as required then, and was commissioned ensign in 1903. He had served as an engineering officer, ordnance officer, aide and staff officer in his early years. In 1916, he commanded his own destroyer, but his particular abilities as a staff officer brought him to the Atlantic Fleet in World War I, and there he served with distinction as fleet intelligence officer and later as war plans officer. He had commanded a destroyer division in the Pacific Fleet. He had commanded a battleship, the USS Nevada, the destroyer flotilla of the Pacific, and eventually the entire battle force of the Pacific Fleet. Between these assignments were tours in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, a course at the War College, a tour teaching at the War College, and various special assignments. He was a successful and admirable officer. He was noted as a strategist, and some of his subordinates felt he was eminently suited for the command of the fleet, permanently, in this time of crisis. Wanting a man of his own general tenor of thought, Pye had chosen Dremel as his chief of staff for this brief interim period. Together, then, they began a reassessment of the war situation. Dremel's job was to pull together the facts for his superior and make his recommendation, which would be considered along with other recommendations of the senior staff before Pye made the ultimate decision as commander-in-chief. As Dremel examined the messages and intelligence reports, he became more uneasy by the hour. Samoa must be reinforced, that was apparent. But Wake was a different matter. Intercepted messages indicated that the Japanese were moving around the Pacific. Guam had fallen on December 10th to forces from Truk. The three American task forces were widely spread. The difficulties of the Lexington in fueling were known. The tankers supplying the three task forces did not have enough oil to keep all the tanks topped off, and as Dremel contemplated the sharp upswing of the graphical curve of fuel consumption in a warship at top speed, he was dismayed. A ship travelling at 30 knots might consume five times as much fuel as the same ship travelling at 10 knots. If the American vessels were to go into battle, how would they get home, even if they sank every Japanese ship in sight? On December 19th, Admiral Wilson Brown's Task Force 11 and Admiral Fletcher's Task Force 14 were steaming toward their objectives. On the ships, the men were ready for battle, as Brown's message to his force indicated. This force is conducting a reconnaissance raid in enemy water. The Lexington Plains will have their first contact with the enemy. We know they will do a grand job. The rest of us must be prepared to deal with enemy carriers, enemy planes, surface ships and submarines. Be on the alert, keep calm, and use your head. Shoot straight when the opportunity offers. On the ships, the battle preparations continued, and the men were inoculated against tetanus. Task Force 8, refuelled, sailed from Pearl Harbour to support the other two. 
D-Day for the arrival at Wake, relief and possible attack, was December 23rd. In Washington, the naval authorities were engaged in a heated debate over the Wake relief expedition. On December 16th, Admiral Towers had gone into the office of Assistant Secretary Gates to urge Gates to do something. Towers did not then know that Kimmel had evolved his three-prong aggressive plan for the relief of Wake and possible engagement of the Japanese. Towers pleaded with Gates to use his influence with Secretary Knox to break the present defensive attitude in the Pacific Fleet, which definitely has the support of Admiral Turner of War Plans. Towers also asked Gates to recommend most strongly that a heavy force, including at least one carrier, preferably two, be sent to relieve Wake, the carrier, to fly off a squadron of fighters and some dive bombers to land on Wake and assist in its defence. Gates said he would try, not knowing that Kimmel's audacious plan called for the use of all American carriers in the Pacific, three of them, to the distress of the Conservatives who were in control of Washington's naval affairs. On December 19th, as the men of the task forces prepared grimly but eagerly for battle, the command situation of the Navy was thoroughly confused. Nimitz was to be commander of the Pacific Fleet, but he was not in command yet. Secretary Knox, not trusting Admiral Stark's qualities of aggression, had brought Admiral Ernest J. King from the Atlantic Fleet and asked him to take a new post, that of Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, which would outrank the Chief of Naval Operations. President Roosevelt concurred on December 18th, but on December 19th, King was back in Newport, Rhode Island, divesting himself of his old command. In the Pacific, Admiral Pye and his staff were faced with the awful responsibility of supervising the commitment of the entire fighting force of the Pacific Fleet, a commitment Pye had never made, but for which he was now responsible. Pye sat down in his office and estimated the situation on the morning of December 20th, he found evidence of increasing Japanese air activity in the marshals, both land and carrier, and indications of naval activity there too. He feared that the surprise element in the attack of Task Force 11 would be missing, and it was part of his philosophy that carrier operations depended on the element of surprise for effectiveness and safety of the carriers. The Admiral feared that the long delay in initiating the plan had made it possible for the enemy to know that the move was afoot. He blamed the hiatus on the difficulties of the Lexington in fueling in those first days after the Pearl Harbor attack, and this brought his mind again to the fuel problem. The enemy would come up full of fuel, and his forces were short. As Pye saw it, Task Force 14 was relatively safe, at least from enemy air activity, because its operations around Wake would keep the force at least 750 miles from Japanese air bases. But Task Force 11 might be in danger because of the lack of surprise, and serious loss might be sustained. Such a loss would have a seriously depressing morale effect on the fleet and country, and jeopardise the Hawaiian Islands. And then, at the end, either or both task forces might be overtaken by enemy carrier groups full of fuel on the long run back to Pearl Harbour, while only Halsey with Task Force 8 would be there to protect the others. Making this estimate, Admiral Pye issued new orders, changing the operation. Brown's Task Force 11 was called back from the strike on Jalui and ordered to move in to protect Fletcher's Task Force 14 at Wake. Halsey would operate as planned with Task Force 8, with emphasis. Meanwhile, back in Washington, the debate over the Wake relief expedition continued to simmer. On December 16th, Admiral Towers had urgently met with Assistant Secretary Gates, urging decisive action. Unaware of Kimmel's aggressive plans for Wake and potential engagement with the Japanese, Towers implored Gates to influence Secretary Knox to break the defensive stance of the Pacific Fleet, supported by Admiral Turner of War Plans. Towers advocated strongly for sending a heavy force, ideally including two carriers, to relieve Wake, with plans for fighter squadrons and dive bombers to support its defence. Gates, receptive but unaware of Kimmel's broader strategy involving all three American carriers in the Pacific, promised to pursue the matter. As December 19th approached, tensions mounted as Admiral Wilson Brown's Task Force 11 and Admiral Fletcher's Task Force 14 steamed toward their objectives. On board, crews prepared for imminent battle.
Admiral Brown's message to his force conveyed resolve. This force is conducting a reconnaissance raid in enemy waters. The Lexington planes will make initial contact with the enemy. We expect them to perform admirably. The rest of us must be prepared for enemy carriers, planes, surface ships and submarines. Stay vigilant, maintain composure and act decisively when opportunities arise. Preparations continued unabated on the ships, with personnel also receiving tetanus vaccinations. Task Force 8, refuelled and ready, departed Pearl Harbor to reinforce the other two task forces. The scheduled arrival at Wake for relief and possible engagement was set for December 23rd. In the midst of these preparations, the command structure of the Navy in Washington remained in disarray. Although Chester W. Nimitz was designated as the future commander of the Pacific Fleet, he had yet to assume command. Secretary Knox, harbouring doubts about Admiral Stark's assertiveness, had summoned Admiral Ernest J. King from the Atlantic Fleet to assume a new, higher-ranking post. Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, superseding the Chief of Naval Operations. President Roosevelt endorsed this move on December 18th, prompting King to swiftly transition from his former command in Newport, Rhode Island. In the Pacific, Admiral Pye and his staff faced the daunting responsibility of overseeing the deployment of the entire Pacific fleet, an assignment Pye had not anticipated but now assumed. On December 20th, Admiral Pye meticulously assessed the situation. Reports indicated heightened Japanese air activity in the Marshalls, involving both land-based and carrier-based operations. Naval movements were also detected, prompting Pye's concern that the delay in executing their plans had eliminated the element of surprise crucial for carrier operations. The Admiral attributed this delay to initial refuelling challenges faced by the Lexington immediately after the Pearl Harbour attack, which reignited worries about fuel availability, a critical factor in sustaining prolonged operations. Pye assessed Task Force 14 as relatively secure from immediate aerial threats due to its operational proximity to Wake, approximately 750 miles distant from Japanese airbases. In contrast, Task Force 11 faced greater risks due to the loss of surprise and the potential for significant casualties. Pye feared such losses could severely impact fleet morale and jeopardize the defense of Hawaii. Compounding these concerns, he foresaw the possibility of encountering fully fueled enemy carrier groups during their return journey to Pearl Harbor, with only Halsey's Task Force 8 available for protection. Confronted with this sobering analysis, Admiral Pye issued revised orders, altering the operational strategy. Task Force 11, under Admiral Brown, was recalled from its mission to Jalui and directed to provide support and protection to Task Force 14 at Wake. Halsey's Task Force 8 would maintain its planned course, focusing on defensive operations. Meanwhile, Fletcher's Task Force 14 continued its relief efforts at Wake, maintaining close proximity to the island and refraining from engaging enemy forces unnecessarily. On December 20th and 21, Wake Island endured bombing raids, involving at least one Japanese carrier, later identified through radio intelligence as the Soryu, alongside twin-engine planes and dive bombers. Given the volume of aircraft observed, Admiral Dremel suspected the presence of multiple carriers in the vicinity, an observation later confirmed with the presence of both the Soryu and Hiryu. Communication with Wake remained sporadic, relying heavily on reports from the submarine Triton, which patrolled the area. On December 20th, Triton encountered technical issues and was recalled to Pearl Harbor, depriving Pye's command of critical reconnaissance capabilities. The fuel supply issue continued to vex Admiral Fletcher as much as Admiral Pye. On December 21st, Fletcher opted to refuel his destroyers using the tanker Neches, a process that slowed the fleet's progress approximately 600 miles from Wake. The refueling was not completed that day, further complicated by conflicting directives received from Pearl Harbor. One order instructed Fletcher to position 200 miles from Wake and launch reconnaissance flights, while another rescinded this directive, tasking him instead with dispatching the seaplane tender Tangier unescorted to evacuate civilians. At headquarters, Pye and Dremel were worried, 
they now believed there was a sizable Japanese force operating off the island. The three American task forces were widely separated. Dremel did not believe they could close on each other enough to offer mutual support. At 0520 on the morning of December 22nd, the communications officer at Pearl Harbor received a report from the Wake Island commander announcing a Japanese landing attack on the island. Pai and Dremel began to consider the problem. Pai asked Dremel to prepare a situation estimate and said he would do the same. At seven o'clock that morning, Dremel wrote out his estimate. Can the forces at sea in fact relieve Wake? It began. Even if the Tangier lands everything, the best that can be said is, it affords a temporary relief. Further operations must be conducted, a series of them to hold Wake. If this proves impossible, Wake eventually must capitulate. Wake was very weak prior to this attack. Is the condition of Wake after this attack such that the aid on the Tangier will be, can be landed? We must not overlook the fact that this effort of the Japs may be successful. Marine planes must have information before taking off. Wake, now, becomes of secondary importance. The important issue now is action with Jap forces attacking Wake. If Japan is unaware of or has not deduced that our forces at sea may attempt to relieve Wake, he may have inferior forces. On the other hand, if he knows or estimates our strength at sea and deduces their mission as a relief of Wake, he may be fully prepared and set for action. If so, his forces are undoubtedly strong, or what he considers strong enough to do the job. Task Forces 1114 evidently plan to fuel en route returning in event of an action. Such fueling may not be possible. This is a definite weakness. In the event of an engagement with Jap forces is accepted as attempting to support Wake, the possibility of the action developing into a major engagement cannot be overlooked. Are we willing to accept a major engagement at this distance from our base with an uncertainty in the fuel situation? There are no reserves. All our forces are in the area of possible operations. The general situation dictates caution, extreme caution. We must decide either 1. to abandon Wake or 2. accept the risk of a major engagement. An hour later, Captain McMorris presented his estimate. McMorris's analysis was much more detailed than Dremel's. He noted the attacks by the shore-based horizontal bombers and carrier dive bombers. He noted that the size and constitution of the enemy force was uncertain. Only one carrier is known to be present, others may be. If there be additional carriers, they may not participate in the attack, but be disposed to prevent interference with the landing and to attack any of our own forces going to relief of Wake. No real evidence of this. He, too, said that the position of Wake now was secondary. Even though there continue to be strong reasons for relieving that place at an early date. The point is, McMorris said, there is an enemy force, possibly weaker, that we can get at. As for the fuel problem, the exact situation as to fuel is now known but there are strong reasons for feeling that the cruisers and DD destroyers of TF-11 and 14 have recently fuelled and that the CV's fleet carriers of these two forces still have two, three or more of their capacity. TF-8 has thus far steamed only about 1,500 miles. The carrier of that force is a long-range one. The DDs of TF-8 are probably the units least well off in fuel and they can steam a long way at high speed. McMorris agreed that the American forces were widely scattered, but he also said they were converging. The way to clear the situation, said McMorris, is to get at the enemy. He offered four courses of action. Withdraw, attack with Task Force 14 and bring up Task Force 8 and 11 for support. Search a wide area for enemy units and delay a decision until the results of the search are known. Concentrate the three task forces and drive the enemy from Wake. McMorris rejected Course A as unduly cautious, an action that would tend to destroy service and public confidence. He rejected Course C as a temporising and delaying action, and Course D as also delaying, and given the enemy a chance to escape. He advocated attack because this course offers great chance of success against enemy forces off Wake, 
and added possibility of damaging or destroying the enemy forces piecemeal if they are in the vicinity. Even though the enemy be encountered in superior strength, the chances of falling back without serious losses are excellent. It is an opportunity unlikely to come again soon. And, he noted, we are in great need of a victory. Admiral Pai had to make the decision. Pai's own estimate was dated at seven o'clock in the morning, and McMorris's, apparently coming in an hour later, did not change his views. Pye reasoned that the enemy knew the American relief forces were coming, and thus timed their attack. The danger to damaged ships at 200 miles from base must not be underestimated. A loss of a large part of our forces would make possible a major operation against the Hawaiian Islands. We cannot afford such losses at present. A. Direct Task Force 14 to attack enemy forces, Task Forces 8 and 11 to become involved only in covering the retirement of Task Force 14, or B. Retiring all forces without any attempt to attack enemy concentrated near Wake. In deciding, Admiral Pai was assisted by a message from Admiral Stark, who said that he and Admiral King both then considered Wake Island to be more trouble than it was worth. OPNAV dispatch just received states Wake will continue to be a liability and authorises evacuation. Evacuation is impossible. It will eventually be forced to capitulate. The real question at issue is, shall we take the chance of the loss of a carrier group to attempt to attack the enemy forces in the vicinity of Wake? Admiral Pai's answer was no. Task forces 8, 11 and 14 were ordered to retire immediately to the northeast, then come back to Pearl Harbor. Thus the decision was made to avoid the first chance the United States had to avenge the destruction at Pearl Harbor. When the official orders flashed through the air and arrived at the task forces, they were greeted with anger and dismay. On Admiral Fletcher's flagship the talk was so mutinous that he left the bridge, and Admiral Fitch left his bridge for the same reason. Halsey was furious, but Admirals Halsey, Fletcher, Brown and Fitch were disciplined to obey the orders of higher authority. It has been suggested that Fletcher might have turned off his radios and gone in to attack in spite of Pye's recall, but to do so without sufficient intelligence and without the support of the others could have been suicidal, and had he won any less than a clear-cut victory over the Japanese, Fletcher would undoubtedly have been court-martialed. Such decisions were made only by Horatio Nelson, and even Nelson had the advantage of seeing his enemy before deciding on an engagement. Also, despite the need for a victory, the war plans, since at least 1939, had assumed conflict in both East and West, and the primary mission of the United States Navy in the Pacific was the defence of Hawaii and the West Coast until decision was achieved in Europe, whereupon the resources of the United States and possible allies could be turned to the Pacific. Right or wrong, the decision was the responsibility of Admiral Pai, a decision made in those first wretched days of the Pacific War. It could be argued, and was, that Pai's primary responsibility under the American war plan was to protect the continental United States and Hawaii. The conservatives among the admirals believed he had done just right. The more daring believed he had missed one of the great opportunities of war. Like millions of other Americans, Rear Admiral Chester W. Nimitz was at home on Sunday, December 7th, when the first word of the Pearl Harbor attack was broadcast over the radio. Nimitz happened to be listening to a concert by the New York Philharmonic Orchestra when the music was interrupted by a scarcely contained announcer who brought the bad news. Unlike millions of other Americans, however, Nimitz did not take the report of the disaster as a signal for despair or shock, but as a call to action. The Admiral rose from his chair, telephoned his assistant, Captain John F. Shafroth, and when Shafroth arrived at the Nimitz home, the two headed for the main Navy building in downtown Washington. Nimitz went to the Bureau of Navigation, his own office, to consult the war plan. Like Artemis Gates in Pensacola, Nimitz discovered that the plans were carefully protected against mishap, locked in a safe, secured by a time lock that was set to open on Monday morning. Nimitz was joined by others who came drifting in as they learned the news, admirals and lesser officers and civilians. Rear Admiral Jack Towers came and immediately plunged into the preparation of dispatches and memos about the disposition of Army and Navy aviation forces,
Most of the admirals and others of this privileged group had no such clear-cut responsibilities, however. They drifted into the office of Secretary Knox, who had come hurrying to the department when he heard the reports. Under Secretary Forrestall arrived, and then Assistant Secretary Bard. Admiral Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, came with his flag secretary, and along came Nimitz's own flag secretary, Lieutenant J.G. H. Arthur Lamar. The conferences began. There was no talk of responsibility, no recrimination. The decision to remove Admiral Kimmel from command of the Pacific Fleet was not made in these meetings. Such a course was not even considered. When he returned from Pearl Harbor a week later, the secretary was determined to make a change. As military historian Fletcher Pratt put it, a fleet commander in any navy holds office on much the same terms as a heavyweight champion. It is neither punishment nor fear that he will repeat his mistake that causes him to be removed when he is once knocked out. Confidence has been lost, and with it full control of the medium. Poor Kimmel. Nimitz said it could have happened to anyone, and of course it could have. There was no way Kimmel could help. He had been denied by Pai his brave gesture in trying to relieve Wake and close with the enemy. Kimmel was facing the Roberts Commission, which that week began meeting in Hawaii, and that commission represented the thinking of Knox and President Roosevelt, as Knox indicated in a letter to Paul Scott Maurer at the Chicago Daily News. That trip of mine to Hawaii was an inspiration that came to me just as I heard the President read his message. Immediately the air was filled with rumours. There was a prospect ahead of a nasty congressional investigation, and I made up my mind in a flash to go out there and get the actual facts, and if the facts warranted it, to initiate the investigation myself. When I found out what the facts were, it didn't take long to start the investigation, and I think the President was pretty happy in the men he chose to conduct it. Kimmel was to be sacrificed to public opinion, and every admiral in the fleet knew it by this time. The fact that in November a fleet exercise had presupposed a Japanese air attack on Oahu meant nothing. There, Task Force 3. Operational Order 11, 41 for exercise, set up the following hypothetical plan in the fall of 1941. White controls the Hawaiian Islands and Palmyra Island. Pearl Harbor is an advanced white fleet base with limited repair facilities, which is defended by a defence battalion of approximately 1,000 marines, numerous guns up to 10-inch in calibre, and about 24 short-range shore-based aircraft. Maui, a nearby atoll, contains an emergency landing field, but otherwise has no facilities. All the Hawaiian islands except Oahu represent undefended atolls. Palmyra Island is an outlying white patrol plane base, the White Homeland is approximately 2,000 miles to the east of Oahu. Black has established an advance base at Midway, which is the easternmost of a chain of atolls under the sovereignty of Black. The Black Homeland is approximately 2,000 miles west of Midway. Was no excuse for Kimmel in the public eye, and that view was shared by many younger officers in the fleet. Commander Arthur Radford was strong in his denunciation of Kimmel. Captain Charles Lockwood was equally furious. Someone should burn for this, he wrote. Admiral Kimmel had been brought to the Pacific Fleet to snap up the fleet and install in it an aggressive attitude. The Pearl Harbor disaster destroyed him, no matter what he might do, because he no longer had Knox's confidence. A change had to be made. Moreover, Congress was clamouring for someone's scalp. It was inconceivable to the members of Congress that their policies and those of previous administrations had brought the United States to so low a military state that one blow, smashing half a dozen battleships and a few cruisers and destroyers, could emasculate the nation's defences. Had Kimmel been retained until a successor could arrive, a victory might have been achieved at Wake. The President and Knox would have none of it. On December 17th, Nimitz was told that he would become commander of the Pacific Fleet as soon as he could reach Pearl Harbour. He demurred, since there were many admirals senior to him on the list, but his superiors insisted, and he accepted the orders with good grace. Nimitz was, if anything, the epitome of the successful officer by Admiral Richardson's exacting standards. The qualities of the Nimitz character were apparent in his face, in his career, and in his heritage. Combined, these factors made him precisely the man he was,
and placed him in this particular situation at this moment in history. Nimitz was a medium-sized man, but with such broad shoulders and erect carriage that he seemed taller than his five feet nine inches, more slender than his one hundred and eighty pounds. He was a physical fitness advocate. He played tennis whenever the weather would allow it, walked long miles to keep his figure trim. But the telling characteristic of Nimitz in this winter of 1941-42 was his mouth, usually carried a thin straight line. He was not a cold man, or a bad-tempered man, quite the contrary. To the world he presented a figure of almost total complacency. He seldom lost his temper or raised his voice. His light blue eyes peered quizzically from beneath a beetling brow that was robbed of fierceness by the light. On December 7th, White learns from intelligence sources that a black force of two heavy cruisers, a carrier and several destroyers are at Midway. By December 10th, relations are so strained that war is expected. At 1200 December 11th, war is declared by Black. Hair of the eyebrows and his fine white hair gave him the air of an elder statesman, but the mouth told more, it indicated an almost continuous and victorious struggle did not prevail. In his job as chief of personnel, Bunav, to juniors he had appeared stern and completely dispassionate. The word sundowner, descriptive of the spit and polish officer, had sometimes been used to describe him, as it was often used to describe Admiral King, the new commander-in-chief. But if King might be able to say that when the going got tough they brought in the tough officers, Nimitz would not have thought of putting the case that way. It could be said that King was a driver who knew how to lead. It could also be said that Nimitz was a leader who conquered any personal urge to drive and achieved his ends more by persuasion and inspiration to men under his command. Not that he was a weak disciplinarian. Flag Secretary Lamar had always found his boss tough in the past, and so had countless other officers. But the Nimitz who was moving to take control of the Pacific Fleet was a man very conscious of a destiny and of his part in the war to be won as a leader of men. The Nimitzes were an old military family. Chester's half-brother Otto was a Naval Academy graduate too, a commander serving in the Bureau of Ordnance. The Admiral's son, Chester Jr., was a lieutenant, junior grade, assigned to a submarine. But these represented only the current generations. The Nimitz family claimed direct descent from an honoured major, Ernst Freiherr von Nimitz, who lived in the 17th century in the German states. He had a coat of arms, featuring a crown. The Freiherr claimed descent from military forebears who went back to the 12th century. Charles Henry Nimitz, Chester's grandfather, had been a merchant seaman, not a profession inclined to gather a man's fortune. Charles Henry, attracted by the New World, had left Bremen in 1844 on one last voyage which carried him and his few belongings to Charleston, South Carolina. He made his way down to Texas, arriving in the spring, and there he settled in the little town of Fredericksburg. He served for a time with the Texas Rangers, and two years after coming to Texas, Charles Henry Nimitz married Sophie Dorothy Muller. He decided to become an innkeeper, which meant then a dance hall proprietor and saloon keeper as well, and he erected a building of sun-dried brick. In the process, Charles Henry's love of the sea overcame him, and the building turned out to be a replica of a ship, a land-bound ship whose balconies were decks ensconced inside railings. Captain Nimitz, for he kept his seagoing title when he came to Texas, was the father of twelve children. They grew up working around the Nimitz Hotel, a landmark quite close to the Pedernales River, and eventually they married and had families of their own. Chester Bernard Nimitz married a Fredericksburg girl named Anna Henke, then died five months later. In February 1885, Chester William Nimitz was born to the widow, who took refuge with her father-in-law at the hotel. For the next six years, Anna and her son lived there, the boy falling under the influence of his grandfather. Yet the real father figure in Chester William Nimitz's life was his stepfather, William Nimitz, for when the boy was six years old, Anna married her youngest brother-in-law. William and Anna had two children, Otto and Dora, but the three youngsters were brought up as brothers and sisters, and the man who was to become commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet always regarded Otto as his brother. The Nimitz family in America was anything but wealthy, 
In centuries past in Germany, the family had the privilege of using von before the name, but along the way this branch of the family descended from a younger son, and the von was dropped as too expensive to maintain in terms of social obligation. It was thus in the New World as well. The hotel on the Pedernales was a haven, and Captain Nimitz was always able to meet any emergency needs among his many children. But by and large they had to make their own way in life, and William Nimitz chose to do something he knew well. He went into hotel management as assistant manager of the St. Charles Hotel in Kerrville, a few miles from Fredericksburg. As a youth, Chester was a towhead. His mother insisted that he wear his hair long, even past the time when a boy began to realise that long hair was for girls. This was the 19th century, remember. Young Chester pondered a means of escaping his torture, and hit upon a brilliant idea. He painted his long hair green. Then it had to come off, to his intense satisfaction. Chester Nimitz might well have gone into hotel keeping, for he was so trained from his early years. His mother ran the kitchen at the St. Charles Hotel, and Chester and Otto did the boys' chores, while little Dora helped her mother. The boys also found outside jobs to earn their spending money, and when Chester was twelve years old, he earned a dollar a week delivering meat around the town for a local butcher. When he was a little older, his stepfather gave him a regular job as a hotel handyman. Chester was paid fifteen dollars a month, and his board and room, like any handyman. For this, he was to light the fires early in the morning and call the early riser at the hotel, do the morning janitorial chores, and then he was free to go to school. After school, he must return for more work. As a teenager then, Chester began a routine of rising at three in the morning, studying until 5.30, then tending his dozen stoves and fireplaces. After school let out at four each afternoon, he would return to the hotel, chop wood and split kindling, rake leaves, sweep up and carry out trash. Then came supper, and after supper he worked as desk clerk until ten, when he retired for the night to a cot in the ladies' parlour of the hotel. Chester did well enough in school, although the course was not terribly demanding. He was known there at Cottonhead, and was as popular as a working boy might be, in the little time he had to spare for amusement. William, his stepfather, was a stern employer, but he was also a very decent man. Even so, there was no hope in the family that Chester would be able to pursue his education beyond high school. There just was not the money for college. With the grace of youth, Chester accepted this condition, and made tentative plans to join a surveying crew when he graduated from high school, and thus learn a useful trade that might lead him into engineering. In the summer of 1900, however, young Nimitz's plans changed completely. One day a pair of new second lieutenants of the United States Army Field Artillery stopped off at the St. Charles Hotel for the night, on their way to duty at a summer artillery camp maintained by Fort Sam Houston near Kerrville. The young lieutenants were William M. Cruikshank and William R. Westervelt, and both, Nimitz discovered, had attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Suddenly a whole new world was opened to Chester William Nimitz, if he could only secure an appointment to the military academy and bone up to pass the examinations, he could have the education he wanted, and a dashing career as well. He applied to Congressman James L. Sladen, but was told that all the appointments to the military academy had already been made. Sladen said that he did have one appointment left for the Naval Academy, and that he would make his choice on the basis of the outcome of competitive examinations to be held in the spring of 1901. Was young Mr. Nimitz interested? Mr. Nimitz was interested and began setting his academic house in order. His mother helped him as much as she could. His high school principal tutored him in algebra and geometry. A teacher, Miss Susan Moore, helped him with history and English. Nimitz studied very hard, and when the congressional district examinations were held in April 1901, he was a high man and secured the appointment. He was still not in, however, and would not be until he passed the physical and academic examinations given by the Naval Academy itself. In July, Chester Nimitz came north, and Congressman Sladen accompanied him to Annapolis, where he entered the Verne's Preparatory School to study with masters who knew precisely what the academy demanded. After two months of brushing up, 
Nimitz passed the Naval Academy examinations in August and was sworn in on September 7, 1901, as a naval cadet. He was one of the younger members of his class, having foregone the last year of Texas high school in order to secure the appointment. Other members of this class of 1905 were Royal Ingersoll and Herbert Fairfax Leary, Walter B. Woodson, Ormond Lee Cox, William Ree Furlong, Arthur B. Cook, Harold G. Bowen, William O. Spears, Stanford C. Hooper, John H. Newton, Jr., Andrew F. Carter, Wilhelm L. Friedel, Lawrence N. McNair, John W. Wilcox, Jr., John M. Smelly. These men shared one attribute. All 15 of them, along with Nimitz, rose to flag rank before their careers were ended. Sixteen admirals from a class of 158 plebes. Nimitz, even as a fourth classman, took very well to the Navy way, and the Navy took to him. He was poor, but money made no difference in the equality of these young men. The government paid each fourth classman a dollar and a half a month as spending money, and to make up whatever else was needed, Grandfather Nimitz sent the rest. During the first month, Chester Nimitz feared that he was bilging, failing, in mathematics, but later he found he stood tenth in his class. Life was hard and demanding at the academy. The fourth classmen took artillery instruction, for example, and there were no horses to move the big pieces around. The cadets moved them. One blustery day in that fall of 1901, Cadet Nimitz and several others hauled a heavy field piece from one spot to another and immediately afterward were called into formation to stand in a drafty hallway. Nimitz came down with pneumonia after that adventure, but recovered and was soon up and around again, back at the grind. He did well in the military sciences and mathematics, was good in Spanish but poor in French. In athletics he distinguished himself in crew, a team sort, working up from stroke of the fourth crew to become stroke of the first. His coxswain on the first crew was John Howard Hoover of the class of 1907. Eventually their roles were virtually reversed. Hoover became one of Nimitz's trusted if little-known admirals in the Pacific War. In his first class year, Nimitz was a three-striper, commander of the Eighth Company, which indicated his adherence to the strictures of discipline. He was also seventh in his class academically. Yet he was also an adventurous young man who was not at all afraid to flout the Academy's rules and regulations for a good cause. One such cause was a beer party, illegal of course, but that only made it more enjoyable. In his first class year, Bancroft Hall was ready for occupancy, one wing, and the first classman moved in. Part of the hall was still under construction, and the roof of the new building could be reached by climbing from Nimitz's room. He and his friends climbed there from time to time to drink beer and contemplate the future, throwing the empty beer bottles over the side, where they crashed down among the building materials, to the discomfiture of the established authority. The trick of a beer party in 1904 was to smuggle the beer into Bancroft Hall without getting caught, dire punishment awaiting even the first man in the class, were he apprehended in the crime. Nimitz had a way. The favourite tailor of the cadets in those days was a gentleman named Schmidt who kept a shop on Maryland Avenue, a few blocks from the Academy gates. Taylor Schmidt's popularity arose and was maintained in part because of his willingness in the matter of buying beer for the cadets. One weekend, First Classman Nimitz walked out of the Academy grounds with a suitcase in hand and headed directly for Taylor Schmidt's. Inside the shop he saw his tailor, busily talking to a swarthy man in a dark suit. Cadet Nimitz waited politely for a few moments. The tailor broke off the conversation to ask what the cadet wanted. Nimitz ordered his beer, and Taylor Schmidt nodded, but told the cadet to come back in half an hour and pick up the suitcase. Nimitz walked out onto the sidewalk and spent the next half hour idling along the crooked ways of old Annapolis. He returned to find Taylor Schmidt and the swarthy man still talking. There was a moment of concern. Schmidt might not have got the beer after all. But a look at the tailor, catching his grin and nod, a heft of the suitcase, and all was well. Beer bottles rained down among the bricks and stones again that Saturday night. Among his other duties, honours, Cadet Nimitz served as a section leader, which meant he marched his fellow cadets into class. <laughs>
On Monday morning, after the beery weekend, Nimitz marched his fellow cadets to the science building and smartly led them into their chemistry class, where they were to have a new instructor. Sitting behind the desk at the front of the room was Taylor Schmidt's swarthy friend. To make matters worse, the man was not wearing his dark civilian suit, but a suit of navy blue suit, its sleeves encircled by two and a half stripes. The mystery man of Saturday was Monday's Lieutenant Commander Levi Calvin Bertolet. Chemistry could not command First Classman Nimitz's attention that day or the next. For a week he lived in fear lest he be called up and charged with a very serious breach of academy discipline. Fortunately for Nimitz, Bertolet was an understanding man and an old beer drinker himself from the class of 1887. No call-up came. But Cadet Nimitz learned something for the future. This escapade taught me a lesson on how to behave for the remainder of my stay at the academy. It also taught me to look with a lenient and tolerant eye on first offenders when in later years they appeared before me as a commanding officer holding a mast. Nimitz's class was graduated ahead of schedule to meet the needs of an expanding fleet, by this time culled down to a total of 114 past midshipmen, with Nimitz still seventh in his class. In the lucky bag, the class annual, Nimitz was characterised as Wordsworth's man of cheerful yesterdays and confident tomorrow, and he was said to possess that calm and steady-going Dutch way that gets at the bottom of things. He was also a mixer of famous punches, and, most significantly, in light of what was to come, a man who always played to win. You always play to win, he later told an interviewer. That's the only way. Years later, the New Yorker magazine would report, A man who used to box with young Nimitz at Annapolis told us about the time he gave Nimitz a bloody nose. When I saw what I had done, I took off my gloves and walked out of the gym, he said. I could see he'd kill me if he could, so I just broke off the action. And now, in 1941, speaking figuratively, the Japanese had again bloodied Admiral Nimitz's nose. From the very beginning of his naval career, Nimitz showed a nice balance of fighting toughness, brilliance in his work, steadfastness, respect for discipline, and audacity. He was a humble man of humble beginnings. His family was too poor to come to Annapolis for his graduation from the academy, and he never forgot that fact. Ten years later, he paid the expenses of his mother and half-sister to come and see half-brother Otto graduate, for otherwise he knew they still could not make the trip. Chester Nimitz was glad to be out of the academy, pleased to have what he called the gruelling course behind him. He resented nothing, he was immensely grateful for the education, and as for the rest, he recalled the philosophy of his sea captain grandfather. The sea, like life itself, is a stern taskmaster, old Captain Nimitz had said. The best way to get along with either is to learn all you can, then do your best and don't worry, especially about things over which you have no control. His grandfather's words, such encounters as that with Lieutenant Commander Bertolet, and the other residue of the stiff discipline of academy life, brought Nimitz to accept that philosophy wholeheartedly and to cling to it. Asked what he had liked least about his academy education, Nimitz refused to consider the question. What is behind is behind, he said. It never pays to worry about those things over which you have no control. This refusal to look back, at least in anguish, was to mark Nimitz's career and grant him many good nights' sleep in situations when other men stayed up late worrying. Nimitz left the academy with a month's leave, which he spent in Texas, and then reported to the USS Ohio, flagship designate of the Asiatic fleet, which was lying in San Francisco Bay. As a lowly past midshipman, he went to the Orient. He showed his audacity one day in Japan. He and five other midshipmen from Ohio were invited to a garden party given by the Japanese emperor in his gardens, in honour of the victory of the Japanese army and navy over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. The major architect of that victory, Admiral Heihachiro Togo, was at the party, and the youngsters wanted to meet him. Nimitz was the one pushed forward by his friends to invite the Admiral to the table. In 1907, Nimitz was given command of a tiny gunboat taken from the Spanish in the late war, the original Panay, whose namesake would become so famous in the Yangtze River later on. <laughs>
Nimitz, 21 years old, was also commander of a miniature naval base at Pollock on Mindanao Island in the Philippines. Tiny as the Panay was, Nimitz held a responsible job. He had 50 sailors and marines under his orders. Pollock was so isolated a place that there was not much to do except hunt and fish. Nimitz amused himself by hunting wild pigs with a Datu, chief, named Piang Datu. Even as a youngster, Nimitz was calm and always seemed to be on top of the situation. The Panay was anything but prepossessing, scarcely seaworthy, and when her crew went aboard, they cast caution to the four corners of the universe. One day, travelling up the Rio Grande de Mindanao, the chief engineer called up to the bridge excitedly. We've sprung a leak. She's going to sink. What shall I do? Nimitz had no idea, but he knew how to find out. Look on page 84 of Barton's engineering manual, he shouted back. It tells you what to do. Whatever was done that day, Panay remained afloat and carried her young sea dog of a commander for several more months. In 1907 came a change when President Theodore Roosevelt became incensed against the Japanese and threatened war. The Panay was ordered to Cavite, and when she limped into port there, Nimitz learned way. Ensign Nimitz arrived at Cavite on July 8, 1907, and promptly reported in his best summer whites to Captain Uriah R. Harris, the commandant. Captain Harris handed the young ensign his new orders. He was to report at once to place the USS Decatur in service and to be in Olongapo to dry dock in the Dewey floating dock on July 10th. Ensign Nimitz rose to leave. Captain Harris asked him where he was going. Back to the Panay to get my gear. No, you don't, said the Commandant. You go straight to Decatur. I will send your gear to Decatur and some of your Panay crew. Nimitz arose and made his way out, got into a launch, and found his new vessel at a buoy in the small bay off Cavite. She was torpedo boat destroyer number five, built by the William R. Trigg Company of Richmond, launched by the great grandniece of Stephen Decatur himself. She was 250 feet overall, with a beam of 23 feet 7 inches, a displacement of 420 tons, and a mean draft of 6 feet 6 inches. Her trial speed had been 28.1 knots. She was built to be armed with whitehead torpedoes, two tubes, five six-pounder guns, and two three-inch .50 caliber rapid-fire guns. Decatur had been launched in the fall of 1900 and had served as flagship of the first torpedo flotilla on the Asiatic station until 1905, when she was placed in reserve, or in mothballs, as a later generation would put it. Ensign Nimitz found a ship encased in red lead from stem to stern, completely stripped of guns and stores. There was not a drop of fresh water or a pound of coal on board. He was greeted pleasantly by two Filipino watchmen, who did not know or much care that this young man was supposed to have that ship in dry dock many miles away within 72 hours. Nimitz looked around the harbour. Two miles away he saw a cluster of ships, and from them came two boats, heading towards Decatur. They came alongside. In one was Ensign J. M. Smelly, a classmate of Nimitz's, with two or three men. In the other was Ensign Hugh Allen, class of 1906, with three or four men. They boarded, and he read them his orders. All hands worked every hour, Nimitz said, to get equipment on board. Supplies, guns, torpedoes, ammunition, etc., about 1400 on the 10th of July, the flotilla commander, Frank McCrary, Lieutenant USN in the Chauncey, approached and ordered me to clear the buoy and follow him to Olongapo. We had lighters full of heavy gear on each side, and our compass and binnacle was still on the lighter. We got everything on deck by 1600 and got rid of our Filipino working party. In the meantime, the boilers had been lighted, steam raised, engines tested, and at 1600 I was on the bridge ordering, cast loose. I rang one quarter speed astern on both engines, and we began to drift ahead slowly. I ordered one half speed astern, and we moved ahead faster. As the wind had drifted us away from the buoy by this time, it was convenient to keep moving ahead. Then, full speed astern, and we went ahead at about twelve knots, and took position astern Chauncey headed for Olongapo. Our engine telegraphs had been reversed. 
Eventually, the Decatur was pushed, limping, to Olongapo Dry Dock, and after ministries by the dockyard there, she was declared fit for sea service. Nimitz then proceeded to run his second command aground. It happened one night in Batangas Bay. Nimitz was moving in, on the southern end of Batan Island, and he was more or less following prescribed procedures. But instead of checking his speed precisely, he ordered the patent log brought in, for they were in shallow water and near their destination, and he made a few rough estimates as to course, speed and the navigation guides in the bay. They had been travelling at about ten knots. Suddenly the Decatur shuddered and stopped. They were aground on a mud bank. In peacetime running, a ship aground has cost many an officer his career. The Navy brass has always taken a dim view of officers who are negligent in their navigation. Nimitz might well have spent a sleepless night on Decatur as the tropical dark crept down around his shoulders. But he remembered his grandfather's words of wisdom. Having tried to back off and slide off, and seeing that there was nothing to be done to move his ship, Nimitz had a cot brought up on deck and went to sleep. Next morning, an island steamer came by their mud bank and towed the Decatur off. Since they had been stuck in mud, there was no damage to the ship, and it was just possible that Nimitz could get away without even mentioning the affair. In later years he remarked that if he had it to do over again he would do just that. But he reported himself as having gone aground. Had he known that Rear Admiral John Hemphill was smarting from an official rebuke at the moment, he would not have been so gallant, perhaps. A short time before, two of Nimitz's classmates had gone out on the town in Manila. In the course of a riotous evening, they had boarded the Navy ferry that ran up the Pasig River, and there had engaged in an altercation with the ferryboat captain, a Filipino. The disagreement had become violent, and the two young ensigns had resolved the difficulty by throwing the captain overboard, into the river. Hemphill had heard of the incident, but had decided it was a case of high spirits and had done nothing. Higher authority had not approved, and Hemphill was simply waiting for another one of the young bloods to step out of line. Unknowing, Nimitz reported his grounding, and on July 28, 1908, Ensign Chester W. Nimitz was brought to trial before a general court-martial. The charges were long and very specific, involving excessive speed, lack of caution, failure to observe the normal running procedures, and failure to use navigational aids. Nimitz's defence was spirited, his major point being that the type of ship he was commanding demanded a devil-may-care attitude, and that was what he had exhibited. Perhaps Commander Walter McLean, President of the Court, was impressed by this daring, if not strictly regulation, argument. Perhaps Nimitz's general demeanour and his quiet confidence impressed the Court. Perhaps the members of the Court realised that no damage had been done, the ship was a rust bucket at best, and the young officer had turned himself in. Young officers were often grounding destroyers and other ships, or hanging them onto docks. The attitude of boards of inquiry and courts martial was to accept the fact that inexperienced men were commanding ships. Whatever went through their minds, the officers of the court treated Nimitz very gently. He was convicted of a lesser charge, that of hazarding a ship of the United States Navy, and given a reprimand that Rear Admiral Hemphill delivered simply by publishing the results of the court martial and making a copy a part of Nimitz's service record. When he was sent back to the United States, Nimitz asked for battleship duty. He got submarines. It was the policy of the Navy in those years to place officers where they were needed, without much consideration of junior officers' preferences. Nimitz's court-martial probably did not help very much either. The admirals in Washington confined him to the bottom. Cheerfully, as usual, Nimitz accepted the decision of his superiors and set out to rebuild a shaky career. The Navy was not then very high on submarines, and Nimitz was made executive officer of his pig boat, the USS Plunger, even though he was very junior and very inexperienced. He enjoyed the assignment. As he said later, I have enjoyed every one of my assignments, and I believe that it has been so because of my making a point to become as deeply immersed and as interested in each activity as it was possible for me to become. In his service in submarines, Nimitz gained much respect for two qualities, mental stability and physical fitness. 
it was essential that an officer be quiet, contained, and thoroughly confident of himself and his crew in these highly imperfect early submarines, with their cranky diving gear and foul air. Officers and men had to be physically fit to withstand the tensions, the pressures, and the discomforts of life in a dripping tube. The A-1, his first submarine, was 61 feet long and had her engine at one end and her torpedo tubes at the other. The men lived on top of the storage battery in the knowledge that it would certainly produce deadly chlorine gas if water got in. Nimitz was then the only officer, and he spent nearly all of his time on the bridge or in the conning tower. He rose rapidly in this stepchild service and became commander of the Snapper in 1910 when she was commissioned. He was also a brand new lieutenant that year. By November, he was transferred to the Narwhal and given duty as commander of Submarine Division 3. In 1912, he took the skipjack. By then, Nimitz was one of the most knowledgeable men in the Navy on the subject of undersea warfare. In December 1912, his article, Military Value and Tactics of Modern Submarines, appeared as the lead in the United States Naval Institute Proceedings, the trade journal of the Navy Officer Corps. To appreciate Nimitz's views, one must remember that in 1912 the Germans had not yet shown how deadly a submarine can be. Nimitz felt impelled to argue the complete case of the submarine in terms of its communications ability, mobility, invulnerability to attack and offensive strength. He predicted that the mobility of submarines would advance more rapidly than that of surface craft. He argued the case of the spindle-shaped submersible against the ship-shaped submarine and indicated that the future of the submersible was greater than that of the other in the long run. He made his case with a little quiet humour, unusual in articles in the proceedings, as when he discussed the gasoline jag from which men suffered before the gasoline engines were replaced by diesels in the submarines. The aid of several men is sometimes necessary to control the struggles of the jag and thus prevent self-injury before he loses consciousness from the fumes of the engine. The after-effect of such a case is usually a violent nausea and headache and an extreme distrust of the gasoline engine. The argument in proceedings did not immediately change the fleet's employment of the submarine, but Nimitz continued to fight for the service, and when at 27 he was put in command of the Atlantic Fleet Submarine Force, he was much more effective. His career had completely recovered and was moving ahead by this time. In 1912 he had distinguished himself by leaping overboard to save a fireman from drowning and had earned a silver life-saving medal. In the spring of 1913 he had married and settled down, as much as a Navy man can, to raise a family. He was very lucky in one sense. He and Mrs Nimitz, the former Catherine Vance Freeman of Wollaston, Massachusetts, had a sort of honeymoon ashore. Nimitz, having regained the confidence of the Bureau of Navigation, was given a dream assignment. In the summer of 1913, the Navy sent the young officer to Nuremberg and Ghent to study developments in diesel engines. He then came home to build and install the first US Navy diesel engines in the tanker Malmi, working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Here the years of discipline, training and a way of life were put to the crisis. Nimitz then shared an office in the machinery division of the Navy Yard with Lieutenant W.S. Anderson, the Ordnance Superintendent. Both men were receiving the Navy's lordly pay, $240 a month plus $48 a month in lieu of quarters, a sum that did not pay the monthly rent in Brooklyn, and they commiserate with one another over this fact at their adjoining desks. One day in 1915, a civilian came into the office to talk to Nimitz, and Anderson could not help overhearing the conversation. The civilian represented a company in St. Louis that wanted to manufacture diesel engines. They were having problems, and they had heard of the Malmi and of Nimitz. They wanted to hire Nimitz to solve their problems, and they would offer him $25,000 a year and a five-year contract if he would Navy, resign course, from the Navy and did not prevail. In his job as Chief of Personnel, Bunav, to juniors he had appeared stern and completely dispassionate. The word sundowner, descriptive of the spit and polish officer, had sometimes been used to describe him, as it was often used to describe Admiral King, the new commander-in-chief. But if King might be able to say that when the going got tough they brought in the tough officers, Nimitz would not have thought of putting the case that way. 
It could be said that King was a driver who knew how to lead. It could also be said that Nimitz was a leader who conquered any personal urge to drive and achieved his ends more by persuasion and inspiration to men under his command. Not that he was a weak disciplinarian. Flag Secretary Lamar had always found his boss tough in the past, and so had countless other officers. But the Nimitz, who was moving to take control of the Pacific Fleet, was a man very conscious of a destiny and of his part in the war to be won as a leader of men. The Nimitzes were an old military family. Chester's half-brother Otto was a Naval Academy graduate too, a commander serving in the Bureau of Ordnance. The Admiral's son, Chester Jr., was a lieutenant, junior grade, assigned to a submarine. But these represented only the current generations. The Nimitz family claimed direct descent from an honoured major, Ernst Freiherr von Nimitz, who lived in the 17th century in the German states. He had a coat of arms, featuring a crown. The Freiherr claimed descent from military forebears who went back to the 12th century. Charles Henry Nimitz, Chester's grandfather, had been a merchant seaman, not a profession inclined to gather a man's fortune. Charles Henry, attracted by the New World, had left Bremen in 1844 on one last voyage which carried him and his few belongings to Charleston, South Carolina. He made his way down to Texas, arriving in the spring, and there he settled in the little town of Fredericksburg. He served for a time with the Texas Rangers, and two years after coming to Texas, Charles Henry Nimitz married Sophie Dorothy Muller. He decided to become an innkeeper, which meant then a dance hall proprietor and saloon keeper as well, and he erected a building of sun-dried brick. In the process, Charles Henry's love of the sea overcame him, and the building turned out to be a replica of a ship, a land-bound ship whose balconies were decks ensconced inside railings. Captain Nimitz, for he kept his seagoing title when he came to Texas, was the father of twelve children. They grew up working around the Nimitz Hotel, a landmark quite close to the Pedernales River, and eventually they married and had families of their own. Chester Bernard Nimitz married a Fredericksburg girl named Anna Henke, then died five months later. In February 1885, Chester William Nimitz was born to the widow, who took refuge with her father-in-law at the hotel. For the next six years, Anna and her son lived there, the boy falling under the influence of his grandfather. Yet the real father figure in Chester William Nimitz's life was his stepfather, William Nimitz, for when the boy was six years old, Anna married her youngest brother-in-law. William and Anna had two children, Otto and Dora, but the three youngsters were brought up as brothers and sisters, and the man who was to become commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet always regarded Otto as his brother. The Nimitz family in America was anything but wealthy. In centuries past in Germany, the family had the privilege of using Von before the name, but along the way this branch of the family descended from a younger son, and the Von was dropped as too expensive to maintain in terms of social obligation. It was thus in the New World as well. The hotel on the Pedernales was a haven, and Captain Nimitz was always able to meet any emergency needs among his many children. But by and large they had to make their own way in life, and William Nimitz chose to do something he knew well. He went into hotel management as assistant manager of the St. Charles Hotel in Kerrville, a few miles from Fredericksburg. As a youth, Chester was a towhead. His mother insisted that he wear his hair long, even past the time when a boy began to realise that long hair was for girls. This was the 19th century, remember. Young Chester pondered a means of escaping his torture and hit upon a brilliant idea. He painted his long hair green. Then it had to come off, to his intense satisfaction. Chester Nimitz might well have gone into hotel keeping, for he was so trained from his early years. His mother ran the kitchen at the St. Charles Hotel, and Chester and Otto did the boys' chores, while little Dora helped her mother. The boys also found outside jobs to earn their spending money, and when Chester was twelve years old, he earned a dollar a week delivering meat around the town for a local butcher. When he was a little older, his stepfather gave him a regular job as a hotel handyman. Chester was paid $15 a month and his board and room like any handyman. For this, he was to light the fires early in the morning and call the early riser at the hotel, do the morning janitorial chores, and then he was free to go to school, 
After school, he must return for more work. As a teenager then, Chester began a routine of rising at three in the morning, studying until 5.30, then tending his dozen stoves and fireplaces. After school let out at four each afternoon, he would return to the hotel, chop wood and split kindling, rake leaves, sweep up and carry out trash. Then came supper, and after supper he worked as desk clerk until ten, when he retired for the night to a cot in the ladies' parlour of the hotel. Chester did well enough in school, although the course was not terribly demanding. He was known there at Cottonhead, and was as popular as a working boy might be, in the little time he had to spare for amusement. William, his stepfather, was a stern employer, but he was also a very decent man. Even so, there was no hope in the family that Chester would be able to pursue his education beyond high school. There just was not the money for college. With the grace of youth, Chester accepted this condition and made tentative plans to join a surveying crew when he graduated from high school and thus learn a useful trade that might lead him into engineering. In the summer of 1900, however, young Nimitz's plans changed completely. One day, a pair of new second lieutenants of the United States Army Field Artillery stopped off at the St. Charles Hotel for the night, on their way to duty at a summer artillery camp maintained by Fort Sam Houston near Kerrville. The young lieutenants were William M. Cruikshank and William Earl Westervelt, and both, Nimitz discovered, had attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Suddenly, a whole new world was opened to Chester William Nimitz, if he could only secure an appointment to the military academy and bone up to pass the examinations, he could have the education he wanted, and a dashing career as well. He applied to Congressman James L. Sladen, but was told that all the appointments to the military academy had already been made. Sladen said that he did have one appointment left for the Naval Academy, and that he would make his choice on the basis of the outcome of competitive examinations to be held in the spring of 1901. Was young Mr. Nimitz interested? Mr. Nimitz was interested and began setting his academic house in order. His mother helped him as much as she could. His high school principal tutored him in algebra and geometry. A teacher, Miss Susan Moore, helped him with history and English. Nimitz studied very hard, and when the congressional district examinations were held in April 1901, he was a high man and secured the appointment. He was still not in, however, and would not be until he passed the physical and academic examinations given by the Naval Academy itself. In July, Chester Nimitz came north, and Congressman Sladen accompanied him to Annapolis, where he entered the Verne's Preparatory School to study with masters who knew precisely what the Academy demanded. After two months of brushing up, Nimitz passed the Naval Academy examinations in August, and was sworn in on September 7th, 1901, as a naval cadet. He was one of the younger members of his class, having foregone the last year of Texas high school in order to secure the appointment. Other members of this class of 1905 were Royal Ingersoll and Herbert Fairfax Leary, Walter B. Woodson, Ormond Lee Cox, William Ree Furlong, Arthur B. Cook, Harold G. Bowen, William O. Spears, Stanford C. Hooper, John H. Newton, Jr., Andrew F. Carter, Wilhelm L. Friedel, Lawrence N. McNair, John W. Wilcox, Jr., John M. Smelly. These men shared one attribute. All fifteen of them, along with Nimitz, rose to flag rank before their careers were ended. Sixteen admirals from a class of 158 plebes. Nimitz, even as a fourth classman, took very well to the Navy way, and the Navy took to him. He was poor, but money made no difference in the equality of these young men. The government paid each fourth classman a dollar and a half a month as spending money, and to make up whatever else was needed, Grandfather Nimitz sent the rest. During the first month, Chester Nimitz feared that he was bilging, failing, in mathematics, but later he found he stood tenth in his class. Life was hard and demanding at the academy. The fourth classmen took artillery instruction, for example, and there were no horses to move the big pieces around. The cadets moved them. One blustery day in that fall of 1901, Cadet Nimitz and several others hauled a heavy field piece from one spot to another and immediately afterward were called into formation to stand in a drafty hallway 
Nimitz came down with pneumonia after that adventure, but recovered and was soon up and around again, back at the grind. He did well in the military sciences and mathematics, was good in Spanish, but poor in French. In athletics he distinguished himself in crew, a team sort, working up from stroke of the fourth crew to become stroke of the first. His coxswain on the first crew was John Howard Hoover, of the class of 1907. Eventually their roles were virtually reversed. Hoover became one of Nimitz's trusted if little-known admirals in the Pacific War. In his first-class year, Nimitz was a three-striper, commander of the Eighth Company, which indicated his adherence to the strictures of discipline. He was also seventh in his class academically. Yet he was also an adventurous young man who was not at all afraid to flout the Academy's rules and regulations for a good cause. One such cause was a beer party, illegal of course, but that only made it more enjoyable. In his first class year, Bancroft Hall was ready for occupancy, one wing, and the first classman moved in. Part of the hall was still under construction, and the roof of the new building could be reached by climbing from Nimitz's room. He and his friends climbed there from time to time to drink beer and contemplate the future, throwing the empty beer bottles over the side, where they crashed down among the building materials, to the discomfiture of the established authority. The trick of a beer party in 1904 was to smuggle the beer into Bancroft Hall without getting caught, dire punishment awaiting even the first man in the class, were he apprehended in the crime. Nimitz had a way. The favourite tailor of the cadets in those days was a gentleman named Schmidt who kept a shop on Maryland Avenue, a few blocks from the Academy gates. Taylor Schmidt's popularity arose and was maintained in part because of his willingness in the matter of buying beer for the cadets. One weekend, First Classman Nimitz walked out of the Academy grounds with a suitcase in hand and headed directly for Taylor Schmidt's. Inside the shop he saw his tailor, busily talking to a swarthy man in a dark suit. Cadet Nimitz waited politely for a few moments. The tailor broke off the conversation to ask what the cadet wanted. Nimitz ordered his beer, and Taylor Schmidt nodded, but told the cadet to come back in half an hour and pick up the suitcase. Nimitz walked out onto the sidewalk and spent the next half hour idling along the crooked ways of old Annapolis. He returned to find Taylor Schmidt and the swarthy man still talking. There was a moment of concern. Schmidt might not have got the beer after all. But a look at the tailor, catching his grin and nod, a heft of the suitcase, and all was well. Beer bottles rained down among the bricks and stones again that Saturday night. Among his other duties, honours, Cadet Nimitz served as a section leader, which meant he marched his fellow cadets into class. On Monday morning, after the beery weekend, Nimitz marched his fellow cadets to the science building and smartly led them into their chemistry class, where they were to have a new instructor. Sitting behind the desk at the front of the room was Taylor Schmidt's swarthy friend. To make matters worse, the man was not wearing his dark civilian suit, but a suit of navy blue suit, its sleeves encircled by two and a half stripes. The mystery man of Saturday was Monday's Lieutenant Commander Levi Calvin Bertolet. Chemistry could not command First Classman Nimitz's attention that day or the next. For a week he lived in fear lest he be called up and charged with a very serious breach of academy discipline. Fortunately for Nimitz, Bertolet was an understanding man and an old beer drinker himself from the class of 1887. No call-up came. But Cadet Nimitz learned something for the future. This escapade taught me a lesson on how to behave for the remainder of my stay at the academy. It also taught me to look with a lenient and tolerant eye on first offenders when in later years they appeared before me as a commanding officer holding a mast. Nimitz's class was graduated ahead of schedule to meet the needs of an expanding fleet, by this time culled down to a total of 114 past midshipmen, with Nimitz still seventh in his class. In the lucky bag, the class annual, Nimitz was characterised as Wordsworth's man of cheerful yesterdays and confident tomorrow, and he was said to possess that calm and steady-going Dutch way that gets at the bottom of things. He was also a mixer of famous punches, and, most significantly, in light of what was to come, a man who always played to win. You always play to win, he later told an interviewer, 
That's the only way. Years later, the New Yorker magazine would report, A man who used to box with young Nimitz at Annapolis told us about the time he gave Nimitz a bloody nose. When I saw what I had done, I took off my gloves and walked out of the gym, he said. I could see he'd kill me if he could, so I just broke off the action. And now, in 1941, speaking figuratively, the Japanese had again bloodied Admiral Nimitz's nose. From the very beginning of his naval career, Nimitz showed a nice balance of fighting toughness, brilliance in his work, steadfastness, respect for discipline, and audacity. He was a humble man of humble beginnings. His family was too poor to come to Annapolis for his graduation from the academy, and he never forgot that fact. Ten years later, he paid the expenses of his mother and half-sister to come and see half-brother Otto graduate, for otherwise he knew they still could not make the trip. Chester Nimitz was glad to be out of the academy, pleased to have what he called the gruelling course behind him. He resented nothing, he was immensely grateful for the education, and as for the rest, he recalled the philosophy of his sea captain grandfather. The sea, like life itself, is a stern taskmaster, old Captain Nimitz had said. The best way to get along with either is to learn all you can, then do your best and don't worry, especially about things over which you have no control. His grandfather's words, such encounters as that with Lieutenant Commander Bertolet, and the other residue of the stiff discipline of academy life, brought Nimitz to accept that philosophy wholeheartedly and to cling to it. Asked what he had liked least about his academy education, Nimitz refused to consider the question. What is behind is behind, he said. It never pays to worry about those things over which you have no control. This refusal to look back, at least in anguish, was to mark Nimitz's career and grant him many good nights' sleep in situations when other men stayed up late worrying. Nimitz left the academy with a month's leave, which he spent in Texas, and then reported to the USS Ohio, flagship designate of the Asiatic fleet, which was lying in San Francisco Bay. As a lowly past midshipman, he went to the Orient. He showed his audacity one day in Japan. He and five other midshipmen from Ohio were invited to a garden party given by the Japanese emperor in his gardens, in honour of the victory of the Japanese army and navy over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. The major architect of that victory, Admiral Heihachiro Togo, was at the party, and the youngsters wanted to meet him. Nimitz was the one pushed forward by his friends to invite the admiral to the table. In 1907, Nimitz was given command of a tiny gunboat taken from the Spanish in the late war, the original Panay, whose namesake would become so famous in the Yangtze River later on. Nimitz, 21 years old, was also commander of a miniature naval base at Pollock on Mindanao Island in the Philippines. Tiny as the Panay was, Nimitz held a responsible job. He had 50 sailors and marines under his orders. Pollock was so isolated a place that there was not much to do except hunt and fish. Nimitz amused himself by hunting wild pigs with a Datu, chief, named Piang Datu. Even as a youngster, Nimitz was calm and always seemed to be on top of the situation. The Panay was anything but prepossessing, scarcely seaworthy, and when her crew went aboard, they cast caution to the four corners of the universe. One day, travelling up the Rio Grande de Mindanao, the chief engineer called up to the bridge excitedly. We've sprung a leak. She's going to sink. What shall I do? Nimitz had no idea, but he knew how to find out. Look on page 84 of Barton's engineering manual, he shouted back. It tells you what to do. Whatever was done that day, Panay remained afloat and carried her young sea dog of a commander for several more months. In 1907 came a change when President Theodore Roosevelt became incensed against the Japanese and threatened war. The Panay was ordered to Cavite, and when she limped into port there, Nimitz learned way. Ensign Nimitz arrived at Cavite on July 8, 1907, and promptly reported in his best summer whites to Captain Uriah R. Harris, the commandant. Captain Harris handed the young ensign his new orders. He was to report at once to place the USS Decatur in service and to be in Olongapo to dry dock in the Dewey floating dock on July 10th. Ensign Nimitz rose to leave. Captain Harris asked him where he was going. 
back to the Pane to get my gear. No, you don't, said the Commandant. You go straight to Decatur. I will send your gear to Decatur and some of your Pane crew. Nimitz arose and made his way out, got into a launch, and found his new vessel at a buoy in the small bay off Cavite. She was torpedo boat destroyer number five, built by the William R. Trigg Company of Richmond, launched by the great grandniece of Stephen Decatur himself. She was 250 feet overall, with a beam of 23 feet 7 inches, a displacement of 420 tons, and a mean draft of 6 feet 6 inches. Her trial speed had been 28.1 knots. She was built to be armed with whitehead torpedoes, two tubes, five six-pounder guns, and two three-inch .50 caliber rapid-fire guns. Decatur had been launched in the fall of 1900 and had served as flagship of the first torpedo flotilla on the Asiatic station until 1905, when she was placed in reserve, or in mothballs, as a later generation would put it. Ensign Nimitz found a ship encased in red lead from stem to stern, completely stripped of guns and stores. There was not a drop of fresh water or a pound of coal on board. He was greeted pleasantly by two Filipino watchmen, who did not know or much care that this young man was supposed to have that ship in dry dock many miles away within 72 hours. Nimitz looked around the harbour. Two miles away he saw a cluster of ships, and from them came two boats heading towards Decatur. They came alongside. In one was Ensign J. M. Smelly, a classmate of Nimitz's, with two or three men. In the other was Ensign Hugh Allen, class of 1906, with three or four men. They boarded, and he read them his orders. All hands worked every hour, Nimitz said, to get equipment on board. Supplies, guns, torpedoes, ammunition, etc. About 1400 on the 10th of July, the flotilla commander, Frank McCrary, Lieutenant USN in the Chauncey, approached and ordered me to clear the buoy and follow him to Olongapo. We had lighters full of heavy gear on each side, and our compass and binnacle was still on the lighter. We got everything on deck by 1600 and got rid of our Filipino working party. In the meantime, the boilers had been lighted, steam raised, engines tested, and at 1600 I was on the bridge ordering, cast loose. I rang one quarter speed astern on both engines, and we began to drift ahead slowly. I ordered one half speed astern, and we moved ahead faster. As the wind had drifted us away from the buoy by this time, it was convenient to keep moving ahead. Then, full speed astern, and we went ahead at about twelve knots and took position astern Chauncey headed for Olongapo. Our engine telegraphs had been reversed. Eventually the Decatur was pushed, limping, to Olongapo dry dock, and after ministries by the dockyard there, she was declared fit for sea service. Nimitz then proceeded to run his second command aground. It happened one night in Batangas Bay. Nimitz was moving in, on the southern end of Batan Island, and he was more or less following prescribed procedures. But instead of checking his speed precisely, he ordered the patent log brought in, for they were in shallow water and near their destination, and he made a few rough estimates as to course, speed and the navigation guides in the bay. They had been travelling at about ten knots. Suddenly the Decatur shuddered and stopped. They were aground on a mud bank. In peacetime running, a ship aground has cost many an officer his career. The Navy brass has always taken a dim view of officers who are negligent in their navigation. Nimitz might well have spent a sleepless night on Decatur as the tropical dark crept down around his shoulders. But he remembered his grandfather's words of wisdom. Having tried to back off and slide off, and seeing that there was nothing to be done to move his ship, Nimitz had a cot brought up on deck and went to sleep. Next morning, an island steamer came by their mud bank and towed the Decatur off. Since they had been stuck in mud, there was no damage to the ship, and it was just possible that Nimitz could get away without even mentioning the affair. In later years he remarked that if he had it to do over again he would do just that. But he reported himself as having gone aground. Had he known that Rear Admiral John Hemphill was smarting from an official rebuke at the moment, he would not have been so gallant, perhaps. A short time before, two of Nimitz's classmates had gone out on the town in Manila. 
In the course of a riotous evening, they had boarded the navy ferry that ran up the Pasig River, and there had engaged in an altercation with the ferryboat captain, a Filipino. The disagreement had become violent, and the two young ensigns had resolved the difficulty by throwing the captain overboard, into the river. Hemphill had heard of the incident, but had decided it was a case of high spirits and had done nothing. Higher authority had not approved, and Hemphill was simply waiting for another one of the young bloods to step out of line. Unknowing, Nimitz reported his grounding, and on July 28, 1908, Ensign Chester W. Nimitz was brought to trial before a general court-martial. The charges were long and very specific, involving excessive speed, lack of caution, failure to observe the normal running procedures, and failure to use navigational aids. Nimitz's defence was spirited, his major point being that the type of ship he was commanding demanded a devil-may-care attitude, and that was what he had exhibited. Perhaps Commander Walter McLean, President of the Court, was impressed by this daring, if not strictly regulation, argument. Perhaps Nimitz's general demeanour and his quiet confidence impressed the Court. Perhaps the members of the Court realised that no damage had been done, the ship was a rust bucket at best, and the young officer had turned himself in. Young officers were often grounding destroyers and other ships, or hanging them onto docks. The attitude of boards of inquiry and courts martial was to accept the fact that inexperienced men were commanding ships. Whatever went through their minds, the officers of the court treated Nimitz very gently. He was convicted of a lesser charge, that of hazarding a ship of the United States Navy, and given a reprimand that Rear Admiral Hemphill delivered simply by publishing the results of the court martial and making a copy a part of Nimitz's service record. When he was sent back to the United States, Nimitz asked for battleship duty. He got submarines. It was the policy of the Navy in those years to place officers where they were needed, without much consideration of junior officers' preferences. Nimitz's court-martial probably did not help very much either. The admirals in Washington confined him to the bottom. Cheerfully, as usual, Nimitz accepted the decision of his superiors and set out to rebuild a shaky career. The Navy was not then very high on submarines, and Nimitz was made executive officer of his pig boat, the USS Plunger, even though he was very junior and very inexperienced. He enjoyed the assignment. As he said later, I have enjoyed every one of my assignments, and I believe that it has been so because of my making a point to become as deeply immersed and as interested in each activity as it was possible for me to become. In his service in submarines, Nimitz gained much respect for two qualities, mental stability and physical fitness. It was essential that an officer be quiet, contained and thoroughly confident of himself and his crew in these highly imperfect early submarines, with their cranky diving gear and foul air. Officers and men had to be physically fit to withstand the tensions, the pressures and the discomforts of life in a dripping tube. The A-1, his first submarine, was 61 feet long and had her engine at one end and her torpedo tubes at the other. The men lived on top of the storage battery in the knowledge that it would certainly produce deadly chlorine gas if water got in. Nimitz was then the only officer and he spent nearly all of his time on the bridge or in the conning tower. He rose rapidly in this stepchild service and became commander of the snapper in 1910 when she was commissioned. He was also a brand new lieutenant that year. By November, he was transferred to the Narwhal and given duty as commander of Submarine Division 3. In 1912, he took the skipjack. By then, Nimitz was one of the most knowledgeable men in the Navy on the subject of undersea warfare. In December 1912, his article Military Value and Tactics of Modern Submarines appeared as the lead in the United States Naval Institute Proceedings, the trade journal of the Navy Officer Corps. To appreciate Nimitz's views, one must remember that in 1912 the Germans had not yet shown how deadly a submarine can be. Nimitz felt impelled to argue the complete case of the submarine in terms of its communications ability, mobility, invulnerability to attack and offensive strength. He predicted that the mobility of submarines would advance more rapidly than that of surface craft. He argued the case of the spindle-shaped submersible against the ship-shaped submarine 
and indicated that the future of the submersible was greater than that of the other in the long run. He made his case with a little quiet humour, unusual in articles in the proceedings, as when he discussed the gasoline jag from which men suffered before the gasoline engines were replaced by diesels in the submarines. The aid of several men is sometimes necessary to control the struggles of the jag and thus prevent self-injury before he loses consciousness from the fumes of the engine. The after-effect of such a case is usually a violent nausea and headache and an extreme distrust of the gasoline engine. The argument in proceedings did not immediately change the fleet's employment of the submarine, but Nimitz continued to fight for the service, and when at 27 he was put in command of the Atlantic Fleet Submarine Force, he was much more effective. His career had completely recovered and was moving ahead by this time. In 1912 he had distinguished himself by leaping overboard to save a fireman from drowning, and had earned a silver life-saving medal. In the spring of 1913, he had married and settled down, as much as a Navy man can, to raise a family. He was very lucky in one sense. He and Mrs Nimitz, the former Catherine Vance Freeman of Wollaston, Massachusetts, had a sort of honeymoon ashore. Nimitz, having regained the confidence of the Bureau of Navigation, was given a dream assignment. In the summer of 1913, the Navy sent the young officer to Nuremberg and Ghent to study developments in diesel engines. He then came home to build and install the first US Navy diesel engines in the tanker Malmi, working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Here the years of discipline, training and a way of life were put to the crisis. Nimitz then shared an office in the machinery division of the Navy Yard with Lieutenant W.S. Anderson, the Ordnance Superintendent. Both men were receiving the Navy's lordly pay, $240 a month plus $48 a month in lieu of quarters, a sum that did not pay the monthly rent in Brooklyn, and they commiserate with one another over this fact at their adjoining desks. One day in 1915, a civilian came into the office to talk to Nimitz, and Anderson could not help overhearing the conversation. The civilian represented a company in St. Louis that wanted to manufacture diesel engines. They were having problems, and they had heard of the Malmi and of Nimitz. They wanted to hire Nimitz to solve their problems, and they would offer him $25,000 a year and a five-year contract if he would resign from the Navy and join the firm. 